In this video I'm going to showcase a complete game made with Unity Dots. The game is Flappy Bird, which is a relatively simple game, but also involves some interesting logic which makes it a great project to do in Dots as in learning experience. This video is more of a showcase, but let me know if you'd like to see a dedicated step-by-step -step tutorial on any of the systems. Alright, let's begin! Hello and welcome, I'm your Code Monkey, and this channel is all about helping you learn how to make your own games with in-depth tutorials made by a professional indie game developer. So if you find the video helpful, consider subscribing. So here I'm going to showcase the project that I built. There's a link in the description where you can play it for yourself in your browser. It also contains links to all of the other elements used in the game, so check it out to learn more about each specific topic. So here is the game, it's Flappy Bird. So the player controls the bird, or I guess in this case the monkey. You have pipes being spawned and they move to the left. Pretty much everything is done using dots entities. The main exception is with the UI. Now if I pause the game, and yep, you can see that there's pretty much no game objects. So the bird is an entity, it's controlled using a dots system. All of the pipes are spawned and moved with systems and dots prefabs. The collisions are handled using dots physics. And I have some dots events being fired and caught by the UI, which is made with normal game objects. This video is made possible thanks to these awesome supporters. Go to patreon.com slash unitycodemonkey to get some perks and help keep the videos free for everyone. One really interesting thing about the making of this game is how I managed to actually make a complete working prototype in just under two hours whilst I was on a flight. So that tells you just how fast you can start working with dots once your brain clicks and you begin to understand the logic of how to work in a data oriented way. What took longer were all of the unique parts that I had to research. So I spent quite a while learning how to fire events from dots and capture them in the UI. I covered that in another video. I also had to learn how to handle changing scenes and cleaning up the dots world and how to construct physics shapes, which led me to learn about blob assets, which I also covered in another video. As I said, this video is more of a showcase, so I'm going to play the game and show an overview of how it's set up. But let me know in the comments if you'd like to see a dedicated step-by-step -step tutorial on each part of how the game was made. Okay, so let's look at the final result. It's the game Flappy Bird, so I'm sure you're familiar with it. The player controls a bird, or in this case a monkey, and the only input is just jumping. The bird is always falling down and the pipes are always being spawned and moving. The goal is to keep jumping and avoiding the pipes. As I pass over a pipe, you can see that the score increases. You can see in the UI it's showing which is my current score. Now the more pipes that I pass, the harder it becomes. You can see the gaps becoming tighter, which makes it more difficult. And if I happen to hit a pipe... Yep, there you go, there's the UI showing the current score, the current high score, and some buttons to retry or go back to the main menu. So press retry and it loads the starting scene, and here I go again. Alright, so this is the core gameplay loop. And again, pretty much everything is done entirely in dots. The main exception is the UI, which as of right now isn't really supported in dots. Now, I also covered making Flappy Bird using normal game objects in a previous video. What I'm doing here is a very similar logic in many cases. So if you followed that video based on game objects, then you'll likely have an easier time following this video based on dots. You'll be able to easily identify the logic and how it relates to the game object way of doing things. Okay, so let's take a look at the project and how it works. First of all, over here is the game scene. It's built in the way that Dots games should be built. So right in here, you don't actually see any game objects with the convert to entity script. What you do see is a subscene. I covered subscenes in a previous video, so check it out to learn more. Essentially, all objects in a subscene automatically get converted into entities. So this is how you should set up a pure Dots project. Put things inside of subscenes rather than putting them outside and using the convert to entity script. Now, right now, the subscene is closed, so what we're seeing all the way in here is the objects as entities. And in the latest version, it added this very nice checkbox. And by clicking on it, there you go, you can see that the subscene has now been open for editing. With the subscene open, we can inspect each individual component and look at them as game objects. So, for example, over here is the background. And you can see it's set up as a game object with a normal mesh and a normal material. And again, you can see there's no convert to entity script because everything inside a subscene automatically gets converted into an entity. Then the clouds in the ground are also just simple basic visual objects. And you can see, for example, here on the ground, there's a tag ground component. And on the cloud, there's the tag cloud component. 
So this is how the movement systems locate these specific objects. So here in the project file scripts, I can see the ground move system. And here it is. As you can see, all it does is an entities with all of the tag round and just moves around that entity. So this is how it identifies the ground entity through the tag component. Now for the ground, it's just moving to the left until it reaches a certain point, then it automatically teleports it to the right. So by doing so, the ground essentially goes on for infinity. So here with the side by side visible, you can see that the ground goes to the left and as soon as it reaches the end, it snaps back and in here it looks flawless. The same thing is happening with the clouds, except they are moving slower in order to give the illusion of a parallax effect, but yep, there you go. I also covered how to do a parallax effect using normal game objects in another video, so check that out as well. So here you can see that we have the background, the clouds, and the ground all as just basic sprites. Then over here we have the bird. You can see it has a basic quad and a material for the visual. Then we have a simple tag to identify it, physics components to handle our collisions, and finally a move speed authoring component. So this is how the bird actually moves up and down. You can see that the component just has a simple float 3. Then over here is the input system. All it does is it listens to the spacebar and sets a value on the move speed component. So you can see that this is a very simple system. Then over here is the bird control system. First of all, you can see that it has an attribute in order to run after the input system. And here what we're doing is just applying some gravity onto our move their speed component. We apply that to the translation. And then finally, just as a nice effect, the rotation is based upon the move speed y. So as the bird jumps, it rotates up, and as it falls, it rotates down. So here it is, jumping up and down and rotating just by pressing the spacebar. So the bird is controlled entirely just by these two systems. Now here you might have noticed we have something called game state being used. Here is the component. It's extremely simple. All we have is an enum and a field to store the state of that enum. This is what keeps track of the total game state. So it's either waiting to start before the player actually starts jumping, then we have playing the game or the player is dead. The way it's set up, it's also very simple. We have the generate authoring component. And again, over here in our subscene, we have a game object right here, the game state with our game state authoring component. So that's it, nothing else. And since there's only one of these components in our world, then we can play around with it as a easy to use singleton. For example, let's look at how the waiting to start works. Here is the dots game handler class. This is just a normal system running some generic logic. Now the bird input system fires off an event whenever the bird jumps. So here is on the input system, we just have a basic event and we invoke it in here, okay. So here on this class, we are subscribing to this event and running this function. And when the bird jumps, the first thing we do is check if the singleton exists, which in this case, it should always exist, but just keep it safe. Now the way you use our singleton is first we call get singleton in order to get the singleton instance. So then we have our component here. Then we just check our state if it is waiting to start. If so, when we have our bird jump, then we switch it to playing. And now here is one very important thing about singletons, which is if you modify the component, then you need to update the singleton with set singleton. If you don't, then all you're doing is modifying just this local copy. So that's the singleton component that handles the main game state. I'll cover singletons in more detail in a separate video, so stay tuned for that. Now, one crucial aspect about the game are the pipes. Here on the side-by-side -side view, you can see how the pipes work. Essentially, they get spawned right in there. The pipes are the ones that move to the left, and when they get into that position, they get destroyed. So you can see the player never actually moves. He only moves vertically, and all the pipes go through him. Now, here in the editor, inside of our subscene, you can see that we don't have any pipes at all. Instead, they are over here on the project files as a prefab. I covered how to instantiate prefab entities in another video, so check it out. Here, what I'm doing is exactly what I covered in that video. So there's this prefab nicely set up. So it's the pipe, it has a simple component and a box collider, then it has the pipe head and pipe body. And then over here on the subscene, there's a game object for the prefab entity holder. And in here, it holds a reference to the prefab object. Then here is the pipe spawner system. So this is what actually spawns the pipes. So down here on our update, the first thing we do is check our singleton. We're only going to spawn pipes if we are playing. Then here we're just counting down some timer and spawning a pipe gap. Now, if you saw the normal game object based Flappy Bird video, then all of this should look very similar. We just have our countdown timer, then we calculate a random gap height and gap size, and then we spawn our pipe gap. 
So the pipe gap spawns a pipe on top and one on bottom. And over here is the function to spawn an individual pipe. You can see that first we get the singleton of the prefab entity component, which holds the pipe prefab. We instantiate that prefab as an entity, and then we set all of the values. So over here, we're setting the translation. Then we're going through the children, because as you saw, the prefab had two children for the head and the body. We position them accordingly to the size and the height. Then down here, we set the scale. And finally, we set the actual physics collider. So this system is responsible solely for spawning the pipes. Then the other system is here, the pipe move system, which actually moves the pipes. So what it does is it moves the pipes and fires off the event when the pipes pass the player. I'll cover events in a bit. You can see that it does an entities for each and just moves the translation of the pipes. And again, here it is side by side. You can see the pipes being created. They move to the left and they get destroyed. Now the player is jumping around and he dies as soon as he hits either the floor or the pipes. Now the testing for hitting the pipes is done using dots physics. So again, if we look inside of our subscene, we can see over here the bird has a sphere collider and a physics body. And then the pipe prefab also has a box collider. The pipe size is set up dynamically, so that's also when the collider is resized accordingly. Then over here I have an object with the very useful physics debug display. We can enable this and run the game. And yep, now we can see the physics representation of all of our colliders. So you can see the bird with the sphere collider, the top and bottom colliders, and as I move, you can see, yep, all of the pipes are being spawned and all of them have the correct shape. And as soon as there's a collision, yep, there you go, there's our game over. Let's look at the collider shape for the pipes. Here is the code where we're spawning the pipe, and then down here we're setting the physics collider shape. Now, dots colliders actually store their shape inside of a blob asset. I've covered blob assets in a previous video, so check it out to learn more. Essentially, blob assets are immutable containers of data, so they cannot be modified. That means that in order to change the size of our collider on the pipe, then I need to actually create a brand new collider shape and assign it on the physics collider component. It took me a while to figure out how to make a new collider shape, but here it is. You access the class of the specific type of collider, so in this case, using the box collider, and call create, then pass in all of the parameters. So passing the box geometry, which takes the size, center orientation, then for the filters, I'm using the same ones that Collider gets converted automatically. And the last thing is I wanted the Collider to be a trigger, so I pass in the trigger flag. So again, this is how you make a custom shape in Dots Physics. You access the class for the specific type of Collider. It returns a blob asset reference. And then finally, you assign that one onto the Physics Collider component. So that sets up the Pipe Collider. Then for handling the Game Over Collision, over here is the Pipe Hit system. And you can see it contains a physics trigger job. Now I covered dots physics triggers in the getting started with dots physics video. So check that out to learn more. Essentially there's this job looking for collisions between the bird, the wall or the pipes. And if it finds one of those collisions, then it fires off this event. Now one very tricky part that took me several days to research during the making of this game were events. I cover normal C-sharp events previously, and if you've seen several of my videos, then you know I use events constantly. They are excellent for helping keep your code clean. But events are also object-based, so that makes them very tricky when working with data-oriented code. After a lot of research, I managed to come up with a way to fire off C-sharp events from DOTS code. I cover that in the DOTS events video, so check it out to learn more. The underlying logic is somewhat complex, but I managed to build these super nice and easy to use classes to handle events. For example, over here is the pipe move system. So this is where we're firing off the pipe passed event, which then gets used in order to calculate the score. So here we define the event, as well as a simple event component. Then we construct our dots events object. And then down here on our update, first we grab the event trigger. This is the struct that is safe to use inside of the entities for each. And then inside the entities for each, we use that trigger in order to trigger the event. And afterwards, we capture the events and we fire off the normal C-sharp event. So then the UI can hook into this and display the current score. So this class took a lot of work to make it, but by now it's really nice and really easy to use. Again, check the full video to see how this works. The pipe hit system here is checking for events in the exact same way. It has the C-sharp event with its component. And then when we have the I trigger events job over here, we are triggering our event. Now listening to the on pipe hit player event is the game over. So that's handled here on this class. It goes into the world, grabs the pipe hit system and subscribes to the on pipe hit player event. 
And then here it is, that function. So you can see that it updates the game state singleton in order to set it to dead. And now the way that I control the rest of the game state is by either enabling or disabling various systems. So here it is, this function that handles a whole bunch of systems and just sets the enable to either true or false. So when there's a game over, all of these get set to false. So for example, the pipe spawner system doesn't run, so it's not going to spawn any pipes. The bird control doesn't run, so it's not going to move the bird and so on. And when we have the waiting to start, then we set them all back to true. Again, that's still in development, so I'm not sure if this is going to end up being the best practice, but in this case, it works just fine. And here on this class, we're also broadcasting a on game over event. So this is a normal C sharp event, which is being caught by the UI. So here in the editor, there's the UI setup, and over here is the nice game over window. It has game over window script. And over here is the game over window script. And down here, you can see that when we have a game over, we show the window, play a nice sound, and showcase the score. So this is pretty much exactly the same as it was in the game object based Flappy Bird project. It just listens to the game over event and shows the window. Now, the UI is the main thing that is still done using normal game objects. So in the editor, you can see it's set up in the canvas with normal game objects, everything just normal as usual. So all of them are based on game objects and all of the scripts are listening to the state of the world through dots events. Right now, there's no built-in way of doing UI in dots, but using this approach works pretty great. Now, lastly, one thing I could have done in dots, but didn't was the sound. I haven't been following the progress of sounds in dots, but I'm pretty sure the Mega City demo was using it, so it's certainly possible. Now, the sound in this game is handled using normal game objects. So as I jump over here, you can see a game object with the sound object being instantiated and then destroyed. So as I go through the pipes, yep, there you go, it spawns and gets destroyed. So just a normal game object with a audio source. But technically, you could also use dots for the sound as well. Okay, so here is the complete project. It's a fully working game and almost entirely built in dots. Doing this project was a great learning experience for me to really put dots to the test. I look forward to doing a more complex dots project in the future. Maybe something like a massive RTS could be fun. Either way, here is a complete project that you can inspect for yourself to see how Dots is already very usable for making a complete game. As I said, this video was more of a showcase of the entire project. Let me know in the comments if you'd like to see a dedicated step-by-step -step tutorial on a specific system used in the game. This video is made possible thanks to these awesome supporters. Go to patreon.com slash unitycodemonkey to get some perks and help keep the videos free for everyone. As always, you can download the project files and utilities from unitycodemonkey.com. Subscribe to the channel for more Unity tutorials, post any questions you have in the comments, and I'll see you next time.